Good evening, and it's absolutely wonderful to have you join me. I've got a case which I want to present to you, and let's start by uh, reading an email which I received. So in this email, he writes, I've been diagnosed with mitral valve regurgitation and will require open heart surgery in the next three to four months. I'm unvaccinated and wish to stay that way. I don't want to receive vaccinated blood products as I believe there is enough evidence to show something is going on there that is not well understood yet. I have multiple unvaccinated people who are prepared to donate to, donate to my operation. Have you any clients that have managed to do this? If not, do you understand how the system will respond to that, how I should go about it, or perhaps a referral to somebody who has experience with this issue? I've spoken to somebody at the transfusion service about autologous blood donation. That's donation of one's own blood. Still, he told me that it's not done routinely as the risk is greater, go figure, and that the surgeon and the transfusion service would discuss the risk on a per case basis. I'm not looking forward to discussing it with the cardiologist or surgeon at all. Now, um, I, I think he um, is right to be uh, perhaps a little bit nervous about discussing this with his uh, uh, specialist. And the reason why is um, in today's um, climate, anybody who questions the safety of the mRNA vaccine is automatically labelled a rabid anti-vaxxer. Uh, whereas I would say this person is a is concerned about his health and wishes to ensure that the right things are done for him. You see, your body uh, cannot be traded in. You cannot ask for um, a replacement if the job is. Uh, stuffed up if it doesn't go right um, so I think it's quite right for him to do his research and to be uh, concerned about any possible long-term health consequences of a medical procedure and in this case receiving uh, the blood of vaccinated people in other words people who whose blood contains messenger RNA, which instructs uh, his cells, his DNA, to make spike protein. Now, let's just um, have a look at some of the possible health concerns. And I'm going to start by looking at um, vaccine shedding. This is where people claim and where there are concerns expressed that vaccinated people may be shedding um, mRNA and spike protein, which then infects unvaccinated people inadvertently. And certainly, if that is the case, uh, I would say blood transfusions would be at the upper level of risk of so-called shedding or um, sharing of uh, those that DNA and spike protein. So let's have a look at a couple of, um, uh, uh, I'll show you a couple of ways in which you can educate yourself. Now, uh, I, will, I want to just say here that I'm not a doctor. I do not diagnose, I cannot diagnose, and I certainly will not prescribe treatments. Uh, but my job here is to inform you so that you, as a um person, as a citizen, as an autonomous being, uh, can uh, inform yourself and make the decisions which are best for you, and uh, and and not uh, just simply blindly go down a track, uh, which may in fact be more in the interests of um, political and commercial uh, agents than for you. So let's have a, have a look. The first thing I want to do is uh, direct you to this website here. Um, it's rumble.com. It's a independent independent video platform uh, which has um, sprung up in response to censorship by YouTube, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, 
from your government and mainstream media. Uh, there are now a number of video independent video platforms which promote free speech. Now, of course, there will be some wacky um, presentations, videos on uh, these platforms, but um, I'm sure you're like me. Um, you didn't come down with the last shower. I'm sure that you are intelligent enough to be able to work out the um, the, the BS from um, the well-informed ones, the well-presented ones. And um, and I would uh, recommend that, um, and what you do is you go in and you go into the search and you type in keywords like mRNA and blood transfusion risk and see what pops up. Now, immediately, this one here by Dr. Asim Malhotra, he was uh, one of the... Um, one of the international uh, figures promoting mRNA vaccines in the over the last couple of years. He has, in the last couple of months, made a complete U-turn and is now calling for mRNA vaccines to be suspended. It's a couple of hours, this presentation here, but I strongly recommend you tuck yourself up in bed uh, and turn it on and have a good listen. Uh, to what Dr. Malhotra um, and others have got to say. And then uh, go down and you will see uh, a number of uh, articles, um, such as uh, one of the key inventors of uh, mRNA um, talking, about, um, uh, uh, talking about this and um, some of these other ones. Dr. Mobin um, is um, definitely another expert worth listening to. Um, so um, there's there's a heap there, and I'll leave it for you to uh, inform yourself um, and decide for yourself as to what's going on. But I think there is enough there to um, express some uh, some concern. Now I'll also point you towards uh, uh, the HatchardReport.com. This is my friend, Dr. Guy Hatchard. His doctorate is actually in genetics. And I've typed in there mRNA DNA damage, and uh, a number of articles have popped up. Uh, Guy has been prolific on this subject, and you can go in and you can read these, and you'll see there's several more um, pages of articles uh, where he talks about um, uh, this. And um, you will see quite a lot um uh, on this uh, and where he touches on this whole idea of um, or concern of uh, mRNA uh, uh, sharing uh, between people inadvertently and also the spike protein. So there's a couple of uh, resources for you. Now, I want to show you uh, uh, a case which um, is rather fascinating. So here are the hands of a professional athlete. And he came to see me because he has developed a blood clot and an aneurysm in one of his calf muscles that is requiring surgery to remedy. And this coincided with um, him shaking hands with a recently vaccinated person. And one of the things that uh, also happened at around the same time is the hand that he shook that person, the vaccinated person with, um, his right hand swelled up and he took a photograph. Here's the photograph of it. And what you can see here is right hand. If you look closely at the knuckles, you'll see that they are puffy compared to his left hand. Now, there, there was no evidence of him falling on it and damaging it or working with chemicals or what have you. The only thing he could put the swelling down to was shaking hands with a recently vaccinated person and his hand swelled up almost instantly and shortly after he was diagnosed with a blood clot in his leg, in his calf muscle. He thought he had pulled his calf muscle. Wake up in the morning with a pulled calf muscle. But no, it's a blood clot. And what we know about blood clots and mRNA vaccines 
is that they are very common indeed. And in fact, I've seen so many vaccine injured people over the last 12 months that I've lost count. So there's an interesting case for you. Now, we'll just go back to here. Now, um, let's have a look at mitral valve regurgitation because um, uh, if he's going to have um, surgery, I'm assuming that that will go ahead. And I do agree that I think it is worth as well insisting that he has blood from unvaccinated persons, including his own. Uh, but he can work that out with his surgeon. Uh, I can't. I can't assist with that. I'm afraid, sadly. Um, but now let's talk about mitral valve regurgitation because it's actually surprisingly common in exhausted high-performance athletes. And I want to show you an example of somebody who uh, suffered mitral valve regurgitation. In other words, floppy uh, a, a floppy valve uh, within one of the chambers of the heart, uh, which means that... Um, uh, after the blood's been pumped out of that chamber, it, some of the blood may um, may flow back in uh, because of the valve uh, prolapsing or being floppy. And uh, that's not very good because it will result in uh, uh, unusual fatigue, breathlessness, um, a loss of performance, and the possibility of blood clots, which could lead to lung issues, heart attack or stroke. So it certainly has to be remedied and it may require surgical uh, remedies, which um, I understand is uh, basically tightening up the ligaments that hold the valve in place. There are other things like putting in an artificial valve um, or a transplant, but um, the, uh, the ones that I'm familiar with is tightening up of the ligaments. Now I'll show you an example because um, you see just tightening up the ligaments in that or um, surgical intervention uh, will of course um, remedy the problem but uh, what was the original cause? Why is it that a healthy fit um, person developed uh, this kind of floppy heart valve and if uh, we don't get to the root cause of it there is a possibility that there may be a recurrence or another um, related issue such as an aneurysm of the aorta or something like that. So let's have a look at what's going, possibly going on. And we'll do that by looking at somebody else who has, who had surgery uh, some years ago for exactly the same issue. And here is a screenshot from his second hair tissue test. He had a hair tissue test just before surgery. And this is the hair tissue test several months later. Now, there are two sets of figures. The lower ones are the original. And the higher ones are the, uh, are the second test after the surgery. Now, what I want you to focus on in particular is copper. And his copper was very low at 0.9. And with supplementation, it has increased to 1.3. However, it needs to be around about 2.5. We want to get it into the reference range up here. So he's still got a little bit of a way to go. Um, but uh, I would add that he is fully recovered or as close to as fully recovered as one could ever expect and uh, back exercising freely. Now, so he's got very low copper. Now, what's the significance of, um, of low copper? Well, let's go into Google and I have typed in copper deficiency and mitral valve prolapse or we could put in a regurgitation. Um, here we are. And see what uh, what um, what Google brings up. Now, by the way, PubMed and NCBI 
um, NLM or NIH. These are all clues of um, of authoritative peer-reviewed studies, uh, if you want to get into those. And uh, that's what I suggest that you focus on. And, um, and what we will see is that there is ample research evidence showing a link between copper deficiency, uh, and in fact, it's copper deficiency and copper zinc imbalances, and um, mitral valve or um, heart movements and um, heart valve issues. So there's plenty there, and, um, and also other forms of heart disease. Um, we can even type into uh, Google um, cholesterol, Um, and um, and uh, and you will see that increases this um, the the um, the susceptibility of lipoproteins to oxidation, which you don't want. Basically, um, uh, the fats in your in your in your circulation going rancid and then uh, causing uh, inflammation and depositing uh, sort of like scum on your blood vessels. Not a good idea. Okay. And um, and by the way, uh, copper supplementation may thus favorably impact these risk factors without any of the side effects often seen in drug treatment. Um, hey, sounds like a good replacement for statins. Um, so um, have a good read uh, of this by just doing these key searches and you make up your own mind. I'm not here to tell you what's going on, but Let's have a look at um, um, a, uh, one of the things that I've found is that in just about all older, exhausted endurance athletes, copper tends to be very low, in some cases exceptionally low. And this may be one of the uh, reasons why we see heart problems in older athletes. And I've written heaps about this. Um, let me, um, uh, so what you will see is that copper deficiency um, is, uh, will lead to problems with cross-linking of collagen and uh, with the result that you end up with weak collagen that stretches and um, becomes uh, weak and uh, fails to bounce back. It's sort of like the difference between uh, a, a trampoline bed or lycra, which is very stretchy and bouncy and so on, as compared to, say, a rotten sailcloth, which when it is stressed, it rips and tears. So uh, there's a, a good, um, there, there's something which uh, not many people seem to um, understand. Um, so uh, just do a Google search, uh, copper deficiency and connective tissue, and you will see the link. And this is a possible explanation why exhausted athletes are at risk of developing heart problems, including uh, valve, uh, leaky valves, uh, valve prolapses, and also other forms of heart disease. So um, that's rather, um, oh, I'll just put in here copper, and let's type in mitochondria. Just to, um, uh, let's put in uh, uh, copper deficiency in mitochondria. And, um, and um, basically, uh, copper is um, integral to mitochondrial function. And mitochondria are like the little powerhouses within your cells. They are where the energy is produced uh, for every aspect of life, of being alive, generating heat, um, and doing things like exercise and so on. And tissue that is most biologically active, such as uh, um, such as your heart, your kidneys, your liver, and in most cases, the brain, uh, th there is a higher concentration of mitochondria. So the more active, the more mitochondria. So, and, and copper, amongst other things, is integral to that. So if somebody does 
uh, enormous amounts of exercise over many years, it's almost inevitable that they're going to deplete their copper levels. And that will result in not just mitochondrial exhaustion, but also potentially structural abnormalities with uh, one's heart and circulation. Got the idea? Um, it's, um, it's a no-brainer in a lot of ways as to uh, what's going on here. Um, so low copper, and you can see uh, this here very clearly illustrated, and I have many, many examples of uh, copper deficiency and its relationship to heart problems. I, I want to point out as well that um, uh, we can have the opposite as well, where copper may be way up here. This is actually very common, especially in women. And, um, and high copper can cause as many problems, if not more, than low copper. Um, the key is to get copper and the other minerals, by the way, into the reference range here. This is perfect health. In theory, there can be no disease if all the minerals that are here are within the reference interval. And by the way, um, low intoxic elements. Uh, this is actually a very good result um, for low toxic elements because toxic elements like arsenic, mercury, cadmium, lead, and aluminium uh, will interfere with nutritional elements, including copper. They act like a uh, the joker in the pack or um, uh, a, a block. They will block or suppress uh, the metabolic uh, functions of these minerals. So uh, I hope you found the, this, uh, this interesting uh, when we look at this. Um, so um, I, I can't really advise on whether or not to have the surgery, um, the merits or not of having, um, of how he has uh, prepares for blood transfusions and so on. But where I definitely can help is ensuring that uh, any surgery goes very well in terms of uh, the nutritional side of things, um, the balancing of nutrients, copper, magnesium, zinc, selenium, and doing it very precisely so that um, there is not further complications afterwards. Um, so uh, I'll leave, it, leave that with you. And um, please, I'm not diagnosing, I'm not giving any medical advice. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm showing you how to do your own research, pointing you in the right direction. So um, if you like what I've uh, presented here, please let me know by leaving comments at the bottom of the article uh, where this video has been posted. And I'll reply as well to any comments uh, or any questions you might have, um, bearing in mind patient confidentiality issues, of course. Okay, so um, uh, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to have you uh, listen in on this presentation. Um, I uh, really hope that you have enjoyed it and got something out of it. And I'll, I'll wish you all the best. Thank you very much and goodbye.